Uh, so yes, ensembles of Bohmian trajectories, real, surreal, and hyperreal, and I'll explain as we go. So this, uh, basically the new, the new work, um, well, relatively new work I'll be talking about here, uh, is done with two groups of co-authors. So there's a theory paper uh, with uh, Michael Hall, who's with me at Griffith University, uh, and also Dirk Andre Deckert. Uh, I haven't attempted to put all the other affiliations for those people who aren't at Griffith University, which is uh, for those who don't know, here in Brisbane, Australia. Uh, and, the, and the second collaboration is the experimental one with the group of Ephraim Steinberg, and, and I'll be talking again about uh, one of the experiments that he talked about this morning. Um, and so I guess I'll be saying a lot of the same things, um, but it's conceptually challenging, so hopefully no one will mind hearing some of those things again. Okay, um, yes. So... Here's an outline of my talk. I'm going to start. Uh, it was a challenge to sort of give a structure to everything that I wanted to talk about. Uh, and so I've done it in this way, talking about uh, sort of some of the major approaches to uh, interpretations of quantum mechanics. Uh, and although it might seem to be superfluous here, I thought I'd be begin by talking about, you know, why do we, are we interested in realist interpretations at all? Uh, and then I'm going to talk about Bohmian mechanics as an obvious example of that. Uh, and why, you know, some of the issues with that and how that relates to the nature of the Bowman trajectories in, in the questions of are they real and are they sur surreal. Uh, then I want to talk about the many worlds interpretation, and that's because what I want to get onto is the third topic is in some sense like combining Bohmian mechanics and many worlds. Uh, so maybe these are better together, uh, and that's this, uh, this new approach that... Uh, that uh, we um, have been developing, um, uh, and in a sense, this is and this is where the hyperreal part comes from, uh, because it's actually taking a Bohmian ensemble and taking it, saying that it's all real, so that it's it's even more real than the usual Bohmian mechanics, and that's why I've called it hyperreal. Okay, um, so to begin with, okay, so quantum mechanics. Orthodox quantum mechanics. So uh, we probably, most of us here, think that there are problems with quantum theory. Um, certainly hardcore gamer agrees that quantum theory has a lot of problems. Um, of course, I think he was probably talking about this. <laughs> anyway, so, so what do I think the problems are with quantum theory? So to put it very briefly, uh, I think there are, there are two big problems. Um, one is the mathematical formalism itself, and the problem with that is that it's just very remote from the everyday world. Uh, but then, then the second problem is Bell's theorem says that we can't replace that problematic formalism by something which is, uh, you know, uh, directly tied to the everyday world in terms of giving a local realistic or locally causal uh, explanation of, of uh, what's going on in, in the space-time sense. So that's the problems. Uh, what are the attitudes you could take toward that problem? Well, one attitude is just to be an operationalist uh, and say, well, who cares whether the formalism is uh, remote from the everyday world? All I care about is being able to predict the results of, of uh, measurements when I do them. Uh, and for, the, for that purpose, you know, th th that's all that I need. Um, the way I see it, the big issue with this operationalist or orthodox uh, approach is, is that if you, if you say that, well, I'm not describing, you know, I'm not ascribing any reality to the quantum world because, uh, you know, all I'm interested in is the macroscopic world, well, then you, you have the issue that if we, the macroscopic observers, everybody, you know, doing science would agree that we are made up of atoms, etc., which are quantum particles, so how can it be that we, the macroscopic observers, are real uh, if we're made up of things to which we're not ascribing any reality? Okay, so if that's, that's the issue, then the obvious uh, other attitude you can take is a, a realist attitude, uh, which is to say that macroscopic observers are real in common with the operationalist approach, uh, but they're real because there is a reality for all quantum systems, and they just inherit that uh, from that. So the rest of the talk I will be about talking about realist approaches, um, but it's worth distinguishing different types of realism. Uh, and in terms of what their attitude is towards the wave function. I'm not uh, claiming that I'm being ex exhaustive here, but I'm going to talk about the types of realism that are relevant to my talk. Okay, so, uh, so for my talk, it's going to be useful to think about this, uh, the, the, the quantum state 
actually as a wave function, that is as a complex function on a high dimensional configuration space. Uh, and so, yeah, if you have a bunch of particles, each of them has three coordinates, so you end up with this large number um, of, of dimensions in configuration space. But I can just write down a Schrodinger equation in that uh, configuration space like that. And then, okay, in the, uh, what I'm gonna take to be the first type of realist approach is to say that that is reality, okay? So that this wave function or pure state, despite its remoteness from the everyday world, is what is real, okay? And that's, I think, the many worlds interpretation, uh, though there are variations. Uh, another approach is to say, yes, that is real, but there is something else which is more connected with the everyday world, which is also real. Uh, and that's really where hidden variables interpretations fit in. And then finally, there's another approach which would say that only something else, so in other words, not the wave function, but there is something else which is connected with the everyday world, but obviously not limited to it because it can't be, you know, we know from Bell's theorem, um, and that's what's real, okay? And this is where the new, the new approach that I'll eventually get to of many interacting worlds will fit in. Um, but to begin with, I want to, to talk more about hidden variables, and so Travis gave a very nice... Uh, presentation yesterday uh, about Bohmian mechanics, which is really the canonical type of hidden variable theory, or sometimes called the de Broglie-Bohm interpretation. Um, the only way I'd slightly differ from, from uh, what Travis said would be to say not that, that there is more than just the wave function and the guiding equation. Uh, really, to, to get the predictions of quantum mechanics, we have to put in an, an assumption that, in some sense, there's a, the, the typicality measure or probability measure for the position uh, of the particle at some time in the past was given by the mod squared of the wave function. Okay, but then that's it, that's it. So it's a very nice theory. You can, you can get these nice trajectories which people have been uh, showing and um, yeah, it all works very nicely. Okay, so, so why, why look any further than that? Um, if, if Bohmian mechanics is, is explained everything and it's a nice realist theory, uh, why will not we just stop there? So uh, one issue is the question of, well, why would we believe Bohmian mechanics in particular to be real? because there are, in fact, the infinitely many possible hidden variable interpretations, okay? Um, they, and it doesn't just have to be based on the position of, or, or the configuration of, of the universe in, in, the, in that sense. Um, now, in general, so Bell was, I think, the first person to think about this generally, and he uh, showed that, in general, you have to write down stochastic equations rather than, than deterministic equations. So you might say, well, that's a reason to, to favor Bohmian mechanics. Okay. Um, but even if you do that, there are actually infinitely many guidance equations which you can write down for the position, um, which are empirically adequate in the sense that they preserve the probability distribution which we know quantum mechanically should hold uh, for, for the positions of the particles. Okay. Um, so why should, so we can ask from the first question, why choose the, the configuration as being the real thing? the positions of particles and fields, et cetera. Uh, and the question, even if we do that, why would we believe in the particular dynamics that Bohmian mechanics says? Okay. Uh, so this, uh, this issue, I'm not saying there's a definitive answer to that, but we can at least address this issue and address it both in a theoretical and an experimental sense. Okay. So the theoretical sense, and Ephraim already talked about it, wherever he is, uh, over there, um, th this morning is that, um, so, so first, if we, if we take determinism as something which we like in a the theory, uh, then we know that we, that we can only do that if we have a hidden variable which has a continuous spectrum. Okay? If it has dis discrete, then it can only change by random jumps. Um, okay, so, uh, but what, you know, what, what would be special about any particular guidance equation for one of these hidden variables? Well, uh, what I showed in this uh, New Journal of Physics article in 2007 uh, is that if we think about doing, if we imagine that we have as the, uh, uh, the ability to do weak and strong measurements, and we've heard quite a lot about weak measurements already, uh, then if we, if we define a velocity for a given preparation of a quantum particle, uh, as well, there are different ways of doing it, as Ephraim talked about. I'll jump straight to the second one. If we just do a, uh, a weak measurement of the velocity of the particle, if we imagine we can do that, and then condition on a strong measurement of the position of the particle immediately afterwards, 
Okay? Um, then that defines a velocity field as a function of where we found the particle. Uh, and it turns out that that comes out to be exactly equal to the Bohmian velocity field. So we get uh, at least that dynamics uh, uniquely in that way. Um, there's a caveat that this only works if the Hamiltonian uh, generating the dynamics uh, is at most quadratic in operators canonically conjugate to the position. I suppose that should be a Q probably. But, um, and you might say, well, that's a bit of a limitation then. That's telling you this, this is not completely general. It's not always giving you the right answer. Uh, but I prefer to look at this as, as a, a feature uh, because the point is that we know, in fact, the Hamiltonians uh, in the world are at most quadratic in the momentum, which is the operator canonically conjugate to position. So if we choose right, the, the hidden variable to be position, then this is all perfectly self-consistent. Whereas if we were to choose the hidden variable to be the momentum, for example, which is another uh, example that we might have thought of, then we'll find that it's not self-consistent. Okay? So this doesn't prove, of course, that Bohmian mechanics is real, but I think it gives you a sense of the self-consistency uh, of and naturalness of Bohmian mechanics um, that doesn't exist for other hidden variable theories. So I think that's that's uh, a point in its favour. Um, okay, so as I said, this this can be addressed then both theoretically and experimentally, and I think this is exactly a picture that Ephraim put up uh, from a paper uh, from his group in in 2011. Um, I probably don't need to say any, any more about that. Except, well, okay, so that you, can, you can measure these trajectories and you get qualitative agreement with uh, the quantum predictions, you see interference, um, it's all very nice. Okay. All right, so now the, the, the more yeah, challenging thing to talk about is this uh, accusation that Bohmian mechanics is surreal and that's a reason not to believe in it. 